application um, previously, but I've kind of moved into games for health. So I'm the Nor I'm a Norwegian representative in the Norwegian uh, the Games for Health um, Europe group, um, which has conference and stuff. And so there's a, a network of people doing games for health, and I'm doing EU proposals in, in health areas. Um, and so I link on Runa to become the games for education guy, seeing he's very much in, very interested in learning and has distinction for. Am I? Am I? Enough. Um, and and so um, we've got some papers now. Who's had? Who's actually read the papers? Excellent. Who read the long one, the square paper? Excellent. That's very good. Uh, you scan it and you. My God, this is getting really long. Okay. So um, Kurt Squire comes from a, um, a social sciences background, right? And social sciences papers usually are much longer than. Computer science papers, right? Because you guys, most computer science scientists don't like writing, right? They like programming, but they're not fans of writing. They do it because they have to. Um, whereas social scientists tend to really like to write. So they write and they write and they write. So um, yeah, you, you generally get longer papers, more citations, uh, and often a, for a more theoretical um, kind of discussion of of things that aren't quite as obvious on the surface. A lot of computer science papers will be very kind of direct and this is what we found, we did this, this is what happened, we did this, this is what happened, this is what we measured. Okay? Uh, and so you can kind of see the different methodologies. So in this course, one of the things we'll also look at is not just the content of the papers, but also the way in which they've conducted their research, because you guys are all planning to do masters. Uh, and so you will be conducting a, a reasonable piece so, of so we will be having kind of a meta discussion here in that we're not just discussing the topics, but also the paper and the research in itself, strengths and weaknesses in the way they design it. And so you'll see from my, from my slides as well, and we'll talk about it, what we consider the strengths and weaknesses. And that's what we want you to do when you read the papers as well. Yep. And that's where uh, the game comes into play later on, is to be a little bit critical and, and not just, oh, it's research, that's true. Uh, that's not always the case, but you, you find that researchers will try to make as broad claims as possible, and sometimes they're a little bit broader than what they should be. Sometimes, so you have to be careful to, to understand what they were doing and the basis for their conclusions. But we'll, we'll train a little bit enough. Yep. And so the idea is that we'll we'll do some we'll lead that discussion now, uh, and we'll do that for the first couple of weeks. Um, and so next week I will do game health. Um, and uh, today, this, this is Games for Education Week with, with Runa, and then I've got Costas coming in talking some augmented reality stuff. He's my PhD student on Thursday, um, and we could potentially do the, the Squire paper, depending on how we go today. Uh, and then next week, I will be doing Games for Health papers, and we'll hand, hand those out, and you can read those. And we'll be leading the discussion and critiquing them. What we then want you to do is you guys will then take over leading the discussion, right? So um, I, I'll put up uh, some suggestive papers, and I'm ha open for you guys to find others that you find more interesting. Um, we'll have a, a, a set of topics ranging from games for science through game metrics through kind of a, a bunch of different serious games topics. I want you guys to either use the papers we've got or find your own and lead that discussion, right? And try and follow the model that Runa and I use, right? The idea of we kind of present a little bit of content, and then we start looking at the methodology, the meta levels, and discuss, well, how did they come to those conclusions? How did they do the research? Uh, and then discuss the what we learn from the paper, right? which may not be what the paper is about. Right? So um, sometimes you learn about methodology. Sometimes you learn about how you present data. Sometimes you learn that you shouldn't do it that way. Um, so yeah, um, we'll we'll try and go through that, uh, and we'll start with this the game for education. And, and, and yeah. what, what you'll see both today and later on is that it's kind of fragmented. I mean, we have various papers that aren't always well lined up, and, and uh, so so it's sometimes hard to get to see the larger picture. But we will be emphasizing a, a couple of things, and one of them that we will be hearing, especially when we talk about square paper, is alignment. And, and we'll come back to that, but, but it, it might be a little bit fragmented, so... Yeah, yeah. and so we're, we're, at, at, at the moment we're still in kind of, you know, traditional monk orator, you guys are the pupils and we are the orators, um, 
but um, I've generally tried to move this into a round table session um, where we all sit around the table. This bar bar in the middle and making it square feels a bit odd. I don't feel like a round table, it feels more like a contest when <laughs> we sit there. Um, there's probably enough room in the game lab to sit around the round tables up there. So um, we might discuss moving this to the game lab depending on how many regular people we get showing up. Because um, it's more casual. How many you've been up to the game lab in the 253? Most of you? Not all of you? Okay, it's a more casual space. So um, Maybe too casual? It could almost be too casual. Though it was really interesting having the data projector pointing on the ground because because we had students doing a, 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 a open CV game where you mo step into the game, the player, and it's projected on the ground. Projecting code onto the ground and standing around looking at it <laughs> felt very different to having it up here. Right? And if you put the tables around in a ring and project onto the floor, it's a very different experience. It's more like you're like in a sort of Roman arena kind of, <laughs> are we looking at the combatants down there rather than having them held up behind? It kind of, you feel more critical, actually. It was interesting. Um, mm. Just because you look down. I think because cause, cause you're looking down and you kind of, you're above it. Yeah, it right. feels <laughs> different than when you're sitting here and looking up at it. I, 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 you, you guys know that too when, like, when you talk to people. Um, I, one of the things I used when, when tutoring, uh, I was very strong on this at Otago because we had a lot of students and a lot of students, is instead of coming in, and tutoring from here, right, which is on a dominant position, you crouch down and you get your eyes below the student's eyes. Right? Because that puts them in the leadership role. Because they then direct the discussion and I'm answering their question. Because if I stand over them, I'm now in charge and I'm leading the discussion. So yeah, the interesting positioning really can change the way in which you debate. But okay. I will <laughs> position myself here. Um, and we so, can start talking about any stuff. Those who know me know that I'm very much into models and modeling. So, so I'm going to start this by looking into the learning styles, which you could consider be a model of, of the learners. And uh, well, the good thing about modeling is that you have so many models, you can choose the one you like. <laughs> um, and, and models are simplifications of the world, so they emphasize something, uh, but uh, don't necessarily represent everything that is important for our learners in the world. Um, so when I covered uh, last year, when I was covered the learning styles, I picked up this paper, although the paper isn't very good, I, I, uh, in, in some respects, I mean the study they did, but the, the, the description of the learning styles and a little bit of the basis is, is quite good, so that's why I still keep it. The one thing I disagree mostly with is this, that the purpose is to maximize the outcome from the training. I don't think, um, Necessarily, uh, I agree that uh, uh, you should present material in whatever style that fits the students best. So, so that's kind of I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, but, but the purpose of doing this is to know when we design games or when we look at whether a game would be useful or not. It would be good to know what types of learners do we have. And, and because, as Simon and I will be coming back to several times, you can't make a game that would solve everybody's problem and be the best game ever for every user. So knowing a little bit more about the types of learners and the, uh, the preferences is good. Did any of you do the, uh, any of the questionnaires? The Bark style and the, uh, the learning uh, mentoring? That's not animated. Yeah, the yeah. Honey Mumford uh, questionnaire. Because I put that up a little later. Uh, it's, uh, it's on front as well. I, I put up the link a little bit later. I'm sorry yeah. for that. Yeah. Uh, but these are two different. I'm going to go through them. So were you surprised to see what your preferences were in the park model? <laughs> or did it fit with what you thought? I was a bit surprised when I got my scores. I thought that was much more read write and less visual than I. Did, 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 did. But that, when I think about it, I, I think I agree with the, with the tests more than my <laughs> impression and my. My, my gut feeling. So it's, uh, I think uh, it is good to know what learning styles, you good to know what learning style, but what you use it for is maybe not exactly what this paper is trying to set up. So I'll talk about uh, different models, the Hanley Mumford and the, the Bart model. We already have some tests. The Cobbs model is kind of the same as Hanley Mumford. It was the kind of predecessor. Uh, so I'll cover that as well. 
talk a little bit about issues related to ourselves, and then the meta level discussion, my, my reflections on the paper. And you read the paper, so you can discuss, you can disagree with me, you can argue, or you can talk about the paper. Um, so what basically what I did is um, he's doing a literature review of learning styles, and that's the chapter I really think that you should read. This is the most important part. And then he did a survey of some students' preferred work style, and that part of the paper I don't think is so good. So, uh, but it's worth reading, and, and it's. Uh, might be something that you find useful there anyway. So, <clears throat> Cole, he is looking at two dimensions, as uh, Simon was saying, I think he was saying last time, uh, I mean, it's a, a two-dimensional picture, you have two dimensions, it's easy to draw that way. So what he's looking at is, what is the perception continuum? How do you get to experience, or how is your basis for experience? Is it you are feeling, you are directly feeling and see and, 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 uh, and uh, being in the active kind of world, having a concrete experience, uh, or are you more a thinker? <coughs> so let's say you want to do, you have some sports, throwing a spear, whatever, and so how do you, what's your experience base? Is it all the throws you have or are you thinking about what you should do? So these are two different starting points for learning? Is it do you have a concrete experience or you sit down in your den and think? Then what do you do with it? There's a processing. Do you prefer to actively experiment to see if you understand it correctly? Or do you prefer rather reflecting? So are you doing or are you watching? Or watching others doing and think about what are they doing? Why are they doing this way? What's good? What's bad? So what is your, what is your uh, way of processing and and these arrows the circle here is that uh, typically you start by having a concrete experience uh, someone is telling you something uh, or or you're doing a, a little physical experiment and then you start reflecting on it so what could this mean is there a pattern here and then you try to make a model, you make an abstract model conceptualization. And then you want to test that this model is true, so you do some experiments. And during the experiments, you get some new concrete experiences. So these things are kind of circular. Now, some of us prefer and are stronger on doing this, some are stronger here, and, uh, and different, uh, you can fall into different squares here. Uh, what I think, and, and when I did the, the, the test, and you should do it, uh, the link to the, uh, to the Mumford test, uh, which is kind of similar, they just use different two terms for this. Uh, and what, I, what surprised me is that I, I thought I would be over here. What surprised me is that I'm more over here. So I'm not just making models, but I like to test the models. I like, so models and conceptualization is, is my basis. But I'm much more active in, in testing. Um, but I, I found that I'm kind of moderate on all aspects, and and Marge didn't do the same. So he's more on the active, which is which is more up here. Yeah. Um, but also, I, I did mine as well, and I'm 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 active. Um, and Isaac was very low preference for reflection, apparently. So. Oh, very low. <laughs> <laughs> I was, okay. I was, I was skewing even further that, right. that way. Because yeah. the, the thing with Marge myself is that. We are kind of moderate on all except strong on one. Yeah. Uh, and I think that if you are if you are an academic in computer science, then probably you are you are on one side you're practical, but on the other, as an academic you are probably over here as well. So, but do, do it and, and have a look and see see where you end up. Um, and uh, so if you think I was thinking if we think about computer science just to, to show the difference the different types here. So I was thinking that. Who would be working on going from a concrete experience to a reflective observation? To, and I think that uh, requirements designers, requirements engineering is kind of there. You look at the real world, you look at what people do and observe, and you reflect, and you try to understand and document what the requirements are. Now, going from the observations to an abstract model conceptualization, I was thinking that system architects they would take the requirements and try to come up with a system design. And then, the 
the programmers to implement that design into something that works in real world, and the testers would use all their real world experience to test this. This could be one way to, to see how different groups would prefer certain ways of working. Now, as Simon and I discussed last night, it's definitely useful that the tester has a little bit of that reflection and theoretical approach as well, not just doing the practical. And it makes sense if these guys know a little bit about the, the practical aspect so that the models get to be useful as well, not just theoretically important and, and relevant. So here we get four types, the red ones, four types of, of the users. Those who would like to have that feel, direct the feel, but also do stuff. They feel and they would like to do to learn more about what they feel. These guys, they, they also like to feel, but they like them to watch, sit back and watch and see what others do and, and, and try to, to reflect on it. These, these are the typical academics. These sit down and they think and they watch, they observe and think they don't get dirty Too hands much. at all. Yeah. Well, they can do a lot, but they don't <laughs> get their hands dirty. And then the converging, that, that's what I realized here. This is where I, where, where I, where I am. I'm a thinker, but I like to do. So, trying to see where you are may help in, uh, in, uh, in your own studies. And now the question is, if you're strong here, would that mean that you should work more there because that's your strong side? Well, not. Maybe not. Maybe you should challenge yourself on your weaker sides. That's, that's, one, that's where I disagree with the paper. They are more saying, okay, as, an, as a teacher, you should adapt to the preferred learning style of a student. I'm not so sure. I think you might want to challenge the students on their weaker sides. But if the students are aware of where their strengths and weaknesses are, they can adapt a little bit themselves. So then, these are the types of users or learners and what the characteristics and how would you the converger, so if you go up, the, con the converger is, uh, sorry, is the one that is thinking but wants to do. So the converger likes small group discussions, they are not the risk takers, database programs, computer based learning, it's kind of what, because they like to do. To do, but but they their basis is not ex uh, from from the the concrete experience. It's more from the from the what they're thinking. While the diverger is on the opposite end, so these are the ones who, from real world experience, trying to come up with models. So so here they can try to sit down. So what I explained, they sit down and think about it and create the model. So the existing um, way of teaching works well. The um, a simulator is the, is the thinker. This is the one that's sitting back and thinking about everything. Is uh, the basis for experience is by watching others and is thinking about it. So the typical reading and reflecting and trying to organize everything is something that works. Uh, the accumulator is the one who, like, who likes to experiment, to, to extend his uh, concrete experience base by having more experiments. So I think um, trying to see where you score, trying to see, and also we'll do that a little bit when I come back to, to Hanne Mumford, see yeah. a little bit about, because they live in different, these terms aren't that great, so they have better terms, I feel, so we come back to it when I come to that book. Um, and I, as you see here, it's already talking about the accommodator being able to use games, right? Because that kind of acting, doing, yes. interacting with the simulation is that kind of gamer kind of thing to do. Um, but as we said, it doesn't work for everyone, right? Making a game isn't going to be the best solution for every situation, for every person who's, who's um, working. Uh, and one of the problems we have as computer scientists and particularly game developers, you tend to get stuck in thinking everybody's like you because everybody you spend time with is like you. And whenever you say stuff to people, they understand what you mean. So why doesn't everybody understand what you mean? But then your your target group is probably the ones who are struggling to, to, to study. I mean, you have a master's degree in a while and you try yep. to help provide games to those who have a hard time sit down and study. So so you might not be the representative user. Make, making a training game for um, for uh, teenage mothers 
right? That's one of the other projects we, we had. And so I, I'm not a teenage mum. No. <laughs> And I'm probably almost the least likely person to end up being a teenage mum, I can imagine. Um, but yeah, so I'm not a teenage mum. Uh, none of the other developers were teenage, they were teenage girls. And they were all, you know, a bit geeky. And I don't think any of them had had sex until they got to university. Um, because, you know, they're geeky guys, right? That just, it wasn't, sexuality wasn't really the, the thing they got into at 14. Um, but... You know, so they've got a completely different target group and stuff. And that requires a lot more work. Um, and so this is what the interaction is. design is very much all about. Trying to have processes in which you evolve the actual users into the whole design and the whole setup. So, Hanne and Bamford. Uh, their model is based on Kolb's model, but it has a little bit. It, it started with a circle. I, I don't think Cobb, because you can find many figures uh, showing Cobb's uh, model without the outer circle. But really, uh, Han and Mumford started from the, the circle saying, OK, how does learning, what's the learning process? It starts by someone having an experience. Either you hear something here, or you, you feel and, and, and work on something, and you have an experience. That's the basis for learning. So what do you do then? You. Yeah, you review that experience. You sit down and think, well, what, why, why did this happen? What does this mean? What could be the reason? And then you may come up with a theory, a conclusion. Uh, this is your understanding. But then you would like to, to prove it. You would like to test it to see if it really holds. So that's what you do in the plan next step. You try to see, does it hold? Is it valid so that I can go forward? Now. In this, and, and what, even though all of us who go through this, some of us are good at one or a couple of these steps, not necessarily equally good in all steps. Some of us are better in really challenging ourselves and getting more experience, pushing the limits. Some are more sitting back and saying, okay, what happened here, and, and analyze it. So, so we may have preferences. So the names here is that uh, Hanne Manfred used is the activist. The activist is the one who likes to act. It's the one who likes to have that hands-on feeling, is risk taker, is pushing the limits, trying to, to see what, what, uh, how you can learn. Not by looking at the, the rules and see, but just trying to see if you can, can understand by, by what, what's happening. And then the reflector is the one who sits back and reflects over what he's been seeing. The theorist is the one who takes all the reflections and trying to put it up into a, into a common theory, into a common model, into something that will help him or her understand the world. And the pragmatist is the one who takes that theory and is applying it and trying to see if it holds and if you need to do more, if you need to go back, we have a new experience. So we go back into re reflecting. We go back into come up a new theory. And then we can test that theory and be pragmatic. So, as we could, uh, could hear, Simon and Marish are strong here. Yep, right. But, and I'm strong here. And <laughs> Marish and I, we are equal here. I'm and a little bit lower. Simon isn't much no, no, of a no, no, <laughs> reflector. I'm a little, a little lower. Reflector. Reflector. Oh, going, yeah. oh, okay. You go directly to I'm going to go to the theory. Yeah, okay. I didn't have time to review. <laughs> <laughs> Just, okay. What do you guys think? What do you guys think? Of? Did you do. You're a reflector, <laughs> right? So you compliment Simon. So you compliment Simon. <laughs> so yeah, we would work well in the team, right? Because I would do or stuff. You, and you'd watch and go, whoa. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you, you may just have a problem communicating if you weren't. <laughs> if you weren't aware. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. And if I was to, so, so when I'm supervising, if, if you do your master's with one of us, um, with me, I would kind of take your, you've got a strong reflection skill. So rather than me pushing you, or rather than me saying, well, what, like, you're not being active enough, right? Um, well, I could say, okay, so your, your strength is in reflection. So we can do fewer activities, but you spend more time therefore reflecting on them and get the most out of those activities. Whereas for me, I would do, I would do more things to get the same amount of reflection done. But, the, you, but in the learning perspective, yeah. so in learning perspective, you might want to challenge yourself more of the active side, because that's where your comfort zone is quite narrow, probably. I don't know, it might be. Yeah, so if you, it, it could just 